The Mafia has always had a violent and bloody history within the United States, bringing themselves over with the honest, hard-working Italians and Sicilians that came to America. This underworld organization preyed upon their own people and frightened American natives all the same. One of the most tragic stories in American crime history concerns the kidnapping of an innocent little boy whose family reached out and grabbed the American dream. Even though this crime occurred over 114 years ago, it reverberates through local and national history as an example of extreme brutality and murder. This is a reboot of a previous episode that we did on true crime, Man's Dark Imagination. Our story concerns the prosperity of an immigrant and the hard-working recent arrivals to the French Quarter of the city. Even though these dedicated entrepreneurs managed to climb the economic ladder to providing a better life for their families, a better life than they would have had in their native lands, still, this was the tincture of jealousy among the Italian population and especially through a criminal underbelly that preyed upon their own countrymen. For the Lamana family, the streets of gold paving the new world meant a sacrifice that any parent would dread and exposed the dark side of immigration and dastardly crimes within the city known as the Big Easy. Italians had been a part of the New Orleans mystique since the founding of the colony by the French in 1718. Throughout time, the Italians made a substantial contribution to the development of the local fabric. But, although the Italian people contributed greatly to the culture of the region, stereotypical portraits began to emerge in the late 19th century and proved not only detrimental to Italian assimilation into American society, but also the Italian people as an inherently criminal ethnicity. It was the whites' belief in the criminality of Italians that justified the violent bias and prejudice against the Mediterranean ethnicity. Despite the widespread belief that all Italians had some affiliation with an underworld criminal enterprise, there were those who strived to break free of the dark cloud that hanged over the Italian people as a whole. Peter Lamana was one of the early immigrants to struggle and finally succeed at his chosen profession, Undertaker. In the early evening of June 8, 1907, Mrs. Peter Lamana called all of her children at the table for the nightly family dinner. Despite the merciless heat and humidity of New Orleans summers, children of the city cherished the time of endless play running around the local neighborhoods in bare feet. When Mrs. Lamana noticed that her son did not respond to her first call, she wailed again to see if perhaps he was near. An hour passed, then another, then another, and still no little Walter. A local search party scoured the neighborhood in search of the seven-year-old, but to no avail. Peter Lamana, Walter's father, believed that perhaps his youngest son fell asleep in one of the wagons and the driver never noticed the tyke in the back. Or perhaps Walter had secreted off to visit his favorite uncle near the Lake Pontchartrain lakefront. This later turned out to be untrue. Walter was nowhere to be found. Mr. Lamana then contacted the police and a full-scale search commenced. Every house in the French Quarter opened their doors and gates to their courtyards, but still no Walter. Days went by and authorities asked Peter Lamana if there had been any demands for ransom. Mr. Lamana stated that no ransom demand had ever come to his residence. However, he related an incident two years earlier during the deadly yellow fever epidemic of 1905. A strange visitor rang the bell at the Lamana residence at approximately 2 o'clock in the morning. A young black man handed Mr. Lamana a note. The barely awake undertaker unfolded the note, 
read it to himself, and then asked the young man who'd sent it. The young man then turned to leave without answering the question. Mr. Lamana then threatened the young man that if he saw him again, Lamana would kill him. Despite no demand for a ransom to return little Walter, the local newspaper speculated the young boy became a victim of the hated and brutal Mano Nero, or the Black Hand. The Black Hand functioned as a group of enforcers for the local mafiosi, not only in the New Orleans area, but wherever an Italian conclave gathered within the United States. Local merchants would receive a letter from the extortioners threatening to perform a kidnapping, arson, or worse, the murder of a family member. The Black Hand preyed upon their own Italian people with reckless abandon. Because of Lamana's reasonable modicum of success, his family would make a prime victim for the ruthless group, as well as other Italians who worked the streets of gold in pursuit of the American dream. Until some proof of the Black Hand's involvement, police suspicions remained just speculation. On June 10th, 1907, Peter Lamana finally received a note, but gave no indication to authorities of its contents. But he did say the letter gave Lamana instructions as to where to find his young son. Later, disclosure of the note stated, Mr. Lamana, we beg of you not to be displeased that your son is missing because he's in good hands. As far as eating, he eats good. Conditions are to send some. We demand a small pay, only $6,000. Certainly you won't miss that, you're a son, because we will send him cut in pieces if you don't send us the money. $6,000. A second letter from the alleged kidnappers arrived and warned Mr. Lamana not to call the police. Local citizens hypothesized in the newspapers that little Walter had become a victim of the Black Hand, and that authorities and citizens alike needed to finally rid the area of the hate organization. On June 11, 1907, Italian citizens from all over the city met in the Frances Hall, determined to end the reign of the Black Hand in New Orleans. Even though Italians maintained a deep distrust for authorities, most of them knew that if they did not identify the culprits in the kidnapping of Walter Lamana, the terror would continue. Judge Philip J. Patorno, an influential member of the legal community in New Orleans, accused the police and their detectives of not being aggressive enough to find Walter Lamana. Patorno blamed the police department for not hiring enough Italian detectives who the citizenry would trust enough to divulge any information. As a result of the meeting, the Italian Vigilance Committee formed and vowed to search for the young Walter in a move uncharacteristic of the population, cooperate fully with the authorities in search of the missing child. While the Italian Vigilance Committee met and determined a course of action, Peter Lamana asked that some police officers go with him and try to meet the conditions set forth in the ransom notes. The small group of men set forth to Kenner, Louisiana, a small Italian conclave on the outskirts of New Orleans, where they were joined by more officers determined to find the young boy. The large search party then set off towards St. Charles Parish, where Mr. Lamana was to meet a man and receive further instructions. The entire sojourn produced nothing, and Peter Lamana returned to his home without his son, much to the grief and disappointment of his bereaved wife. On the morning of June 12, 1907, Peter Lamana awoke, after a most harrowing day before, to the news that a local mafia chieftain, Tony Acosta, was seen by witnesses with young Walter on the day of the child's disappearance. A frantic search ensued to find the elusive Acosta. The Italian Vigilance Committee moved to find the perpetrators of the Lamana kidnapping and assisted the police in rounding up the usual suspects. They felt that, among this number, they have the black hand artists who have been making life a burden for them and are implicated in the kidnapping of the boy, Walter Lamana, who is still in the hands of the villains. The acting mayor of New Orleans, James McCracken, emphasized to the vigilance committee that any questioning to be done would be executed with authorities present. The more heinous the crime, the more the rights of the accused would have to be protected. Fears among the Italians pervade, 
Most remembered what happened to the men accused of murdering police chief David C. Hennessy. A jury found the defendants in the murder trial in 1891. Not guilty. And this in turn caused a mass meeting where after being whipped into a frenzy, 10,000 people rushed to the old parish prison and lynched many of the men who, although acquitted of murdering Chief Hennessy, authorities brought them into the prison for their protection. The lynching caused an international incident, and for a time, the United States and Italy stood on the verge of an all-out war. The Italian government tried to claim that some of the murdered men were Italian citizens. In an act to avoid war, the United States paid an indemnity to the families of the murdered men. Still, Italians feared that someone accused of a crime may be dragged from a cell in the middle of the night and dispatched very quickly. Later, in 1896 and 1899, nine more Italians thought to be with the Mafia were lynched without a trial. With the most recent past, the Italian consternation over trusting the authorities was understandable. But now, the whites of New Orleans demonstrated a sense of community as even the most successful citizen joined in the search for Walter Lamana. With few suspects being questioned and authorities actively searching for Tony Costa, Italians in the area learned that the wily gangster was hiding in plain sight. On June 14, 1907, Judge Patorno, who had taken a leading role in the apprehension of anyone who may have been involved in the kidnapping, went to Costa's residence with two police officers. As the group approached the front stoop, they noticed a young girl who ran inside when she saw Patorno and the officers approaching. Paterno and the officer's escort hurried across the street to the Costa residence and drew their weapons. They ran up the stairs and into Costa's room, where he struggled to get out of his bed. Paterno shoved the man back down, held a pistol over the suspect's heart, and dared him to move. The police took Costa into custody. During his questioning, the police made mention that several witnesses stated they saw Costa with little Walter on the day of the child's disappearance when he bought some ice cream for the tyke. During the interrogation, the police also arrested an associate of Costa's, Anthony Sclafani. At the suggestion of District Attorney Chandler Luzenberg, police released all of the suspects with the exception of Costa. Although the suspects released walked away from the police station, apparently unmolested, the police placed full surveillance on them on a 24-hour basis. As Costa sat in jail, one of Costa's associates came forward and provided an affidavit asserting that Costa masterminded the kidnapping of Walter LaManna. On June 16, 1907, police then formally arrested the reputed mafia leader with the kidnapping of the seven-year-old, and then searched for accomplices. In order to keep Costa from communicating with any associates on the outside, police isolated Costa so no information could come from the jail. Police theorized that Ignatio Compischiano provided a wagon with which to secret Walter out of the city. Compischiano then delivered the boy somewhere between Kenner and St. Rose, Louisiana, where the initial search began, and placed the little boy on a small boat to transport their quarry to the west bank of the Mississippi River. Because of his rendition of what happened to young Walter, police arrested Compischiano as a principal accomplice in the crime. The day after Costa's arrest, he received a very interesting visitor. Peter Lamana and Detective John D'Antonio arrived at Costa's cell in the parish prison for a confrontation. Confronted with the potential victim's father, Costa maintained that he did not hurt anyone in Lamana's family and did not know where his son may be. Although Acosta admitted he took Walter to the ice cream shop, he swore he left the boy at approximately 7.45 p.m. on the night of the kidnapping. As he turned to leave the cell, Costa pleaded fervently that he had nothing to do with the little boy's disappearance. Lamana showed no reaction as he left the cell, and finally, the prison. On June 18, 1907, Peter Lamana received another letter that hinted toward a man named Giovanni Barreca, held information as to the whereabouts of his son and the particulars of the plan. After reading the letter, Lamana made a statement to the local press. I shall never see my son again. I could not believe that men could be so cruel. I have lost all faith in my brothers, and all that I can see ahead is years of suffering and misery and perhaps a maniac's cell. If I only knew that poor little Walter was dead, my heart would not be so heavy. 
but the feeling that he is in the hands at the black legs and perhaps being ill-treated and tortured is driving me mad. At dawn on the morning of June 23, 1907, police officers accompanied by Capeschiano searched the woods and swamps located near St. Rose, Louisiana. After an hour of silence, Capisciano, sitting on a log with shackles on his hands and feet, confessed to the crime of kidnapping Walter Lamana and then pointed the way to where little Walter could be located. After wading through waist-deep water, Capisciano led the authorities to the headless torso of a young boy wrapped in a blanket. Dr. Joseph O'Hare, the coroner for Orleans Parish, verified the remains as those of Walter Lamana. The torso lacked the arms, legs, and the head. The rest of the body would be located a few moments later with no doubt as to the identity. Capisciano related what happened the day of Walter's disappearance. The young boy began to cry once the kidnappers brought him to the Capisciano cabin in the woods near St. Rose. Of the four other accomplices that Capisciano identified, one of them grabbed the boy and strangled him to death after Walter refused to cease his crying. Then, the accomplices made the decision to dismember the body and dispose of it in the woods. Police learned that the kidnappers lured Walter away from his home with promises of sweets. The coroner determined that young Walter must have suffered greatly prior to expiring. After news of the discovery reached the local population, a witness came forward by the name of Jenny Garifo and stated that she had witnessed Walter at the Capisciano cabin and one of the accomplices warned her to keep her mouth shut about what she saw or she would disappear. But when it appeared that authorities broke the conspiracy, this brave young woman came forward. On June 24th, 1907, with the information as to the culprits in hand, authorities arrested Lorenzo Giambeluca, Leonard Gebbia, and Tony Gengusa, all suspects of belonging to the Mafia in New Orleans. Giuseppe Catisano and Mrs. Marie Capischiano are arrested as well. Three others, Angelo Incacataro, Francesco Lucesi, and Stefano Monfre fled the jurisdiction when they learned of warrants for their arrest. Because of the volatile atmosphere surrounding the case, then-Governor of Louisiana Newton C. Blanchard vowed to keep order and not have a repeat of the 1891 incident by placing the state militia on alert and ready to quell any disturbance. Governor Blanchard believed in innocent until proven guilty. The police arrested Angelo Montelon, Gebby's brother-in-law and Gebby's sister, Nicolina Gebby. Police believe that Francesco Lucchesi hatched the plot to kidnap the young Walter because he wanted the money to marry Nicola Gebbia. Police further deduce that Frank Gedusa wrote the Black Hand Notes. Once word that the police made the arrest in the kidnapping and murder of his son, Peter Lamana rushed to the Gretna jailhouse to confront the suspects. He swore that if the courts did not dispense justice in his son's case, he would do the job himself. Once the suspects were held in custody, Jenny Garifo elaborated on her initial facts. She stated she awoke on Sunday morning after the kidnapping and had to cut wood in order to make coffee for her father. While in the yard, she noticed two Italian men in Campischiano's yard, and one of the men held the hand of a little boy. The two men then took the young boy into Campischiano's cabin. Later that same day, Ms. Garifo witnessed another man walk into the cabin and then she heard the loud cries of the young child. The next day, Ms. Garifo said that she no longer heard the child's cries. Police later searched the Campischiano cabin and found a small hatchet that appeared to have bloodstains on it and a rope that appeared to have been used. Mrs. Campischiano acted as a lookout while Walter sat in the cabin. When the police questioned Mrs. Campischiano further, she divulged that her husband and his co-conspirators planned to kidnap three children, those of well-to-do Italians in and around New Orleans. On July 4th, the suspects then became defendants in the kidnapping and murder of Walter Lamana. Appointed as their counsel, L. Robert Rivard realized he had a tough road ahead of him to defend the accused kidnappers slash murderers. 
Costa would prove even more difficult to defend because he would not assist in his defense. Additionally, Costa attempted to kill himself by rolling up a handkerchief to hang himself. The effort proved unsuccessful. One of the most emotional incidents of the trial came when Mrs. Lamana came to the stand and cursed the defendants. Their heads hung low, finally showing some sort of remorse. She fainted as she left the stand when she noticed the bloody clothes that Walter wore the day of the kidnapping appear as an exhibit on the prosecution's table. Also during the trial, Leonard Gebbe desired to turn state's evidence and wanted to testify against his co-conspirators. The prosecution agreed to the testimony provided that Gebbia would be completely truthful in his rendition of the events. Gebbia agreed and stated that he overheard a conversation between Campischiano and a man named Joe Di Paella, who owned a farm close to the Campischianos. Police arrested Di Paola later after the initial arrest of the accomplices. Gebbia witnessed Di Paola and Campischiano exchanging some words, and when he moved closer to hear more of the conversation, De Paula fell to his knees and begged Campischiano, For Christ's sake, don't give away on me! Campischiano commanded De Paula to be quiet and get off his knees, for the guard was returning. Campischiano then replied to De Paula that, I'm not going to be hung. My wife is going to get hanged or sent to the penitentiary. What will become of my two children? Will you take care of them both and care for them the same as I would if I were in trouble? Dipala said, I swear. Leonardo Gebbia's testimony proved damning to the defense, especially when he mentioned that he witnessed Costa walk off with little Walter from the ice cream shop, walk to the corner of Royale and Dumaine streets, and place the boy in a covered wagon. Jenny Garifo, the witness who placed the principals at the scene of the crime, corroborated Gebbia's testimony. On the second day of the trial, coroner Dr. Joseph O'Hare testified that he examined the remains of Walter Lamana and performed the autopsy on those said remains. When he produced his findings before the court, O'Hare's recitations drew gas from both the gallery and the jury box. The next witness called by the prosecution was Mrs. Peter Lamana, dressed all in black. Mrs. Lamana stared at the bloody clothing of her dead child that sat on the prosecution's table. As she answered all the questions posed by the prosecution, her tears flowed freely. Mrs. Lamana stood near the end of her testimony and faced the defendants without any prompt and screamed, You are a bunch of murderers. After regaining her composure from the outburst, Mrs. Lamana continued her testimony by saying that a woman matching the description of Mrs. Gebbia came to her door on the following Sunday after Walter's disappearance and stated that Walter had some ice cream at her house and that some unsavory men held him captive and that her husband should pay the ransom money. Not only did Mrs. Gebbia visit Mrs. Lamana after Walter's disappearance, but the entire Gebbia family managed to pay her a visit as well. Mr. Lamana took the stand next and repeated most of his wife's testimony. He had no outbursts, but Peter Lamana looked like a man overcome with grief, pain, and disbelief as his testimony appeared incoherent at times. But the reaction of the gallery and jury could be felt throughout the entire courtroom as Peter Lamana's voice shook with emotion. After his expressive testimony, both the defense and prosecution rested their cases. Judge Edrington gave the jury their charge and stated that the penalty for murder was death. However, they could add the words without capital punishment if they found the defendants guilty as charged. 24 hours after considering all the evidence, the jury found Ignatio Campischiano, Maria Campischiano, Frank Gedusa, and Tony Costa guilty of the kidnapping and murder of Walter Lamana without capital punishment. However, and even though he gave evidence that helped convict the other defendants, Leonardo Gebbia would be tried at a later date along with his sister, Nocolina Gebbia, for the same crime. The citizens of the state of Louisiana, especially at this explosive time in the state's history, tended to respond to verdicts of this type with extra-legal justice. The response of the verdict in this case was not different, but... Law enforcement and government authorities of the state 
reminded the denizens that no incidents that have occurred in the past under such circumstances would be tolerated. The state militia received a call to protect the defendants, and especially the Gebias, from any lynchings or jailhouse retribution. Many argued that to the season's criminals, a life sentence meant nothing. The only justice they would understand, and would serve as further warning to perpetrators contemplating the same crime, was nothing short of paying for their travesty with their lives. But detractors of the sentence stated that the jury obviously misunderstood Edrington's instructions to the jury. Nevertheless, the sentence would stand with the exception of one. Although there were cries for lynching, the act never materialized. After the jury's announced verdict, Ignacio Campisciano finally admitted to what actually happened to Walter Lamana. After Peter Lamana refused to pay the $6,000 ransom, Campisciano admitted to strangling the young boy, but never confessed to the dismembering. The convicted murderer firmly believed that with his confession lay a commutation of the sentence for his wife. On November 13, 1907, Leonardo and Nicolina Gebbia stood trial for the kidnapping and murder of Walter Lamana. D.A. Marrero brought Ignacio Campischiani into the courtroom to testify against the Gebbias, although his testimony would not garner any leniency in his sentence. His testimony was limited, however, because Campischiano refused to identify Gebbia as the man who had ordered the death of the small child. As Campischiano left the witness stand, escorted by an armed guard detail, he passed Peter Lamana on the way out of the courtroom. Peter Lamana swore that he would get the opportunity to kill Campischiano at a later date. D.A. Marrero basically presented the same evidence against the Gebias as he had with the other defendants in the previous trial. After a succinct proceeding, the jury found the Gebias guilty of capital murder and sentenced the brother and sister to death by hanging. The verdict seemed strange to witnesses at the time due to the minor role the brother and sister played in the entire conspiracy. Nevertheless, those who demonstrated sympathy for the victim's family determined the verdict just and true. Even though authorities believed that the principals responsible for the kidnapping and death of seven-year-old Walter Lamana had received their just due, authorities failed to apprehend the other four suspects and they remained at large. In September of 1908, after denial of their appeal, a concerted petition drive began to commute the sentence of Nicolini Gebbia. Seven months had passed, and in 1909, Louisiana State Board of Pardons granted the commutation of Nicolina's sentence. As for her brother Leonardo, there would be no commutation, and his sentence of death would commence. On July 16, 1909, Governor J.Y. Sanders signed Gebbia's death warrant and slated his execution for that very same day. At 12.30, on a hot July Friday, guards from the St. Charles Parish Jail escorted Leonardo Gebbia, along with his priest, a father Moret, to the steps of the gallows. Gebbia suffered some of the indignities of a condemned man as the people present in the yard to witness his execution spat upon him and called him a baby killer. He hesitated at the bottom step, and then, as if a wisp of courage entered his small frame, Gebbia walked up the remainder of the 13 steps in the jail yard where he finally met his executioner, H. M. Johns. Johns, as an experienced hangman, placed Gebbia over the trap door tied his legs and feet together, then placed the customary black hood over the condemned man's head. John took the noose and fastened it around Gebbia's neck, making sure that his neck would immediately break as the trap was released. Johns then looked at the sheriff who gave the signal to release the trap door. Gebbia suffered for almost 15 minutes as his neck did not break. Obviously, Johns did not secure the noose as he thought and Gebbia suffocated to death. Whether Johns did this on purpose has been the topic of much speculation. Nevertheless, Peter Lamana's wish of the suffering of his son's death visited Leonardo Gebbia in his last moments of life.
The other convicts saw their sentences reduced after only serving 11 years due to a law passed by the Louisiana State Legislature that granted good time for sentences other than execution. They all walked out of Angola State Penitentiary sometime in 1918. New Orleans has always been the hub of mafia activity, and some may confuse the term mafia with the black hand. After careful research and consultation with other crime historians, true crime man's dark imagination can honestly proclaim that the black hand was more of an extortion method than an actual organization. The Mafia in New Orleans, and the South for that matter, still used the time-honored threats to obtain money and sustain the fear amongst not only the Mediterranean people in the area, but also spread that fear to other regions as well. On a more positive note, the Walter LaManna case provided some cohesion with the population of New Orleans. The historical record makes plain that Italians were not seriously singled out and the fact that whites in the New Orleans area assisted with the search signified that the long-standing animosity towards Italians and Sicilians began to subside. The Denizens came together in an attempt to save the life of a young Italian boy. Now we're on Rumble, PayPal, and GoFundMe, and I'll leave the links below. We're also on Facebook, Twitter as well. Until next time.